Hi, I'm Barry Farber, and this is Diamonds in the Rough, a show where you'll meet ordinary people who have achieved extraordinary success, people of inspiring stories and who have an overwhelming passion for life. At eight years old, tonight's guest started boxing in the Detroit Parks and Recreation Program. In 1963, he won the National Golden Gloves title. He has been selected twice as Manager of the Year by the Boxing Writer Association of America and has trained four Olympic gold medalists as well as boxing greats Thomas Hearns, Julio Cesar Chavez, Lennox Lewis, Oscar De La Hoya, and current heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. Emmanuel Stewart is here to share his formula for success. We'll be right back. Diamonds in the Rough is brought to you by Custom Cleaner, home dry cleaning kit. We're with a class act. I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, I just I, I had dinner with this gentleman, and um, we started getting a conversation, and we talked about uh, achievement, adversity, and he had some great comments. And it's just glad to have you finally in the studio. It's a pleasure. My pleasure. Um, it's well, I, I, I didn't know that it was going to lead to this, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full gear, huh? We just had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, we did have a good time. I, I wanted to ask you. You know, I read in the intro you talk about all the different awards you won. You know, a Hall of Fame, all these credits. Can we go back to when you were 11 years old and when you started boxing, and, or 8 years old, right? Yeah. How did you get into that? Well, that's strange. I actually started boxing because I got a pair of boxing gloves for Christmas. And uh, it had Jack Dempsey written on it. And I, and I found it more fascinating to jump around and try to hit somebody and let them miss me and hit them back than I did playing with all of the other toys that I had, by train sets and whatever. Sure. And I guess I was just... Uh, so, love that I had for boxing because no one in my family had ever boxed before. There was no interest anywhere. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it actually started in West Virginia, which is where I was born at. Oh, not, not and, Detroit. No, I, I actually moved to Detroit when I was 11 and I just continued. But it started off, uh, I got in a lot of trouble from punching out a lot of feathers in the, uh, in the old pillowcases or whatever. So it was another little bad kid on another part of the country, as we said, around the hill back there. And uh, they brought him over and on a Saturday hooked up some makeshift rings and the men all bet it. It was just like, you know, in the movies. You see, they betted money and uh, and we boxed and I whooped the other little boys. All of the <laughs> men made money, you know. There was no mouthpieces or nothing, just had some little gloves on. And uh, I guess I had about probably 15 or 20 of those. That every two or three weeks they found another bad kid and bring them over. And that's how my boxing actually started. And then, was there a mentor along the way, somebody no. who? Look. Never a mentor, no one I looked up to. And when I went to Detroit, I just got into the legal, proper way of boxing. And I went on to win most of the championships. And then in 1963, I won the National Golden Gloves Championship. Right, 1963. Yeah. What, what, was there anything that you studied, anybody you studied or watched or tried to emulate? or What, what was it, a trait of success to get to that point before we go into you as a manager and trainer? I was a self-made, I guess, boxer, I guess. Pretty much, even as a manager and trainer in boxing, I never had anyone to emulate. I, uh, things have become very natural to me. I, uh, I could sit and see things, and once I got a foundation of something, I could see things, I could move it to another level. And uh, I could see mistakes and little small details. And small details is what make big things happen. And that was the main thing, I think, that I've learned myself, was just to do a little small things. And sometimes you can just master one thing and, and still be excited exceptionally uh, gifted and successful. Muhammad Ali is a good example as, as a boxer. He only he knew how to move, he'd get up a body movement and then throw a jab and throw a right hand. And that's all he could do. He never did learn how to punch the body. He didn't learn all of the other tricks, but he's a very intelligent person. But I've learned in dealing with all athletes and success people, there's a certain uh, character level that they all have and the intelligence level. Uh, successful anything, they're, they're very intelligent and very aware about everything that's going on around them. And I've found that some boxers that I've dealt with, 
I can tell if they're not going to be champion. If they do, it'll be short-lived because you have to have a certain amount well, of Well, what is it? What's the, what, what at that point can you tell right away that somebody is not going to be a champion? Well, it, 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 first of all, you have to have a lot of pride and ego. I don't care what you say. The ego is a major factor in most all success stories and all endeavors in life. And uh, a lot of people losing or winning doesn't really matter that much to them. It's, they want to put up a good showing. Uh, and also, uh, it's, it's, I you don't understand it, but there's one thing I watch that almost all the champions, there is an uh, awareness, alertness about everything that's going on around them. They're not uh, in an incubator with other factors. And most of the boxers I watch, I'm wrapping their hands sometimes. And they're watching everyone that comes into the place. They want to know who's that guy when I'm doing an interview with him or what papers he was with. I've watched that in other boxers who are maybe more talented as far as the physical skills. Mm -hmm. They're not that aware, intelligent, uh, and uh, inquiring about certain things. And that's, that's a strange characteristic that I've noticed about all of the champions. Now, the talent, right, I mean, you can make up for that with a lot of discipline and hard work. What about yes. discipline? And discipline seems to be 90% of what I hear in your industry. Well, discipline, in, in my industry in particular, but in all success stories, but you don't have a team, so to say, in boxing. You, you are the whole team. If I have uh, an advertising that Barry's Boxing Freddy and Barry gets sick, you know, that, I mean, that's the whole show. You can have the, the Knicks going against the Bulls and Michael Jordan could get sick and two or three other the key players, but you still can fulfill your obligations because there's a team concept. And if Michael goes out and say he gets drunk or he hurts his toe or whatever, he can just play a little bit, sit down, someone else can go in. You, you have that luxury, but in boxing, it's strictly one person and you, and you have to be physically and mentally and spiritually almost 100%. And it's so much stress related to that. And it takes special individuals to uh, be able to compete on that level because some guys are just intimidated by other people. And just the psychological uh, fact is a major factor because you don't, you don't have that luxury of saying, well, I can sit down, someone else can play, I, you know, I don't feel good today. But uh, mental strength is, is what makes most all of your great athletes. And when you look at all of the great fights, uh, great sport events, it's a mental toughness that's there that you look at. The, the great fights that we look at our modern time, which uh, a lot of them I was involved in, the Tommy Hearns, the Sugar Ray Leonard Classics, and the Tommy Hearns and the Marvin Hagler fights. What made those fights great was that both guys were guys who just refused to lose, and every time one guy would have refused to lose. I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about what makes a champion, all the different areas, and also I want to know when people are struggling and how adversity helps build character in a situation mm -hmm. that you see all the time, right? I see it too much. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we, be, when we come back with uh, Emmanuel Stewart. Don't go away. back with Emmanuel Stewart and we left the break we were talking about what makes a champion and we also know that when anybody becomes a champion they go through some adversity in their life you, you know when we had dinner we were sitting there and I remember the comment you said nothing builds character like adversity and what have you seen in fighters and maybe what also before that what has turned your what was the turning point for you well personally I had an experience in my life uh, as an athlete that, and it's amazing that most of the athletes when they have had their greatest accomplishments, what they're basically known for, is always seem to have been uh, already had adversity in the picture before the greatest success comes. That's, uh, maybe that's why sometimes the brightest day comes right following the darkest night. Uh, in 1963, I was in the finals of the National Golden Gloves uh, fighting a guy who had, had most all knockouts and he was like the Mike Tyson. Everyone was afraid of him and I was definitely not figured to uh, win the fight because I was so young and I was inexperienced coming into the tournament. And uh, anyway, going into the uh, fight, everyone around me was just telling me, just do good, just, you know, don't get hurt, you know, keep moving, you're a good boxer, this and that. And at the end of the first round, I came back, and the people in my corner were so happy. You did good, you did good, and I thought, and it seemed like I had about almost five days of thinking went through my mind in about five seconds. And I said, you know, I've been boxing since I'm eight years old. I'm 18 years old. Here's a guy that's no bigger than I am. And I'm actually fighting like a coward. I mean, I've been boxing all of my life. Uh, and this man, you know, just is no bigger than me, but it's all the way that everyone around me has got me so scared. 
and I told the people in the corner to shut up, walk to the center of the ring, and I said, I'm going to win this national championship, I'll either get knocked out. I've never been knocked out. I've only lost two decisions in my life. And I, and I just said, I'm going to let it all hang out. And I just went out in the whole stadium. It was in Chicago Stadium. Mm -hmm. And the stadium just erupted and when I came out because we, we stood toe to toe. And it was not me because I was always a flashy boxer. And surprisingly, I went on to beat him decisively, won the national championship, and at that time led Detroit to his first team title in 20 years. Right. And it was a major thing, and, and on the way back home, I thought that if I had just went one more round, it was only a three-round fight, I lost the first round very big, I would have lost. But by just something that snapped in my mind, and my willingness to let it all hang out and take a gamble. Just to go out and not go not all out and block that. that. And that's my greatest accomplishment in my life, that all of the years that I've been away from boxing myself, I can always have my kids, my grandkids can go look and see in the almanacs that their daddy or grandfather in 1963 was the number one amateur boxer in Golden Gloves in the United States. And it all happened in a man. And then from that point on, I learned that most success and failures are determined inside, not outside. That's a real good point. You know, how the mental capacity, you know, they always talk about 80% is mental in the Olympics or wherever they talk about sports. What about the people you've worked with are amazing, you know, from Evander Holyfield, Lennox Lewis, Tommy Hearns, all these, you know, that's a heck of an accomplishment. What is it that you see in, in them as, as, if you could say, here are some traits that I see in a champion, maybe tie some together, whatever. Here are like the three most important traits of a, of a champion, not in just boxing, but in life. The most common trait that I've thought has been consistent with most, all of the success over there, but first of all, there's they are willing to make sacrifices. They have to have discipline. They, uh, you know, regardless of what these guys have discipline. Uh, and there's a lot of pride involved. And then there's also the willingness to gamble. Uh, if you don't have the, the, the desire to take a chance, uh, the willingness to take big gambles, you know, you can, you'd be satisfied probably with normal success. But anyone that achieves abnormal or super success always has taken the element of a big gamble. I don't think that you can have super uh, success without being willing to gamble and right take risks. The risk of element, uh, a risk element is a major factor in major success. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a discipline number one I hear over and over again, that effort, that, you know, continued effort over and over again. They say Kung Fu in the martial arts stands for accomplishment through effort. Kung, accomplishment, Fu, effort. That seems what, you know, the bottom line for boxers, you know, going in. They don't see what, you know, nobody sees what they do out of the ring. No. Except for you. The boxers have a different life than most athletes. I mean, they, first of all, they have to have almost everything perfect. And the last few days leading into an event, I have to myself try to control everything that's fed into the, that man's body and as well as his mind. I try to control the elements of things around him, spend more time talking with him, going for walks. Uh, and, and also match your nutrition wise because that's what you will fight off of your f physical and your mental strength uh, or whatever you have in your body and so I uh, spend a lot of time in that area and in particular talking but uh, yeah are you a great fighter that I had I worked with Aiden Pryor uh, for his second fight with Alexis Aguello and the one common element I watched with all of those guys they would refuse to lose if you look like they're gonna lose a round you know you know the next round is gonna go the other way and all of the fights that we had with Tommy Hearns and Sugar Ray Leonard if we'd have a good round, one round, I said, well, you know that little rascal's coming back the next round, man. I said, look out for it. I mean, that was just that the desire to win and just the uh, and just come determination back again, and just again. refuse to look defeat in the face and say, I'm going to accept it. They said, no, 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 no. And that, that's a common element I found with all of the great fighters. Well, let's do this. When we come back from a break, I'd like to get into, you know, you talk about body, what you put in your body, but also uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the mental preparation before something. And it doesn't matter what you do for a living. This can be applied anywhere what you teach all these boxers. And uh, don't go away, we're gonna be with Emmanuel Stewart. He's a legend, he's a class act, and uh, I'm proud to have him here on the show. Don't go away. back with Emmanuel Stewart and we wanted we went before we went to the break we talked about what you put in your body and also the mental capability and the uh, determination and and you know we, we, when we had dinner we were having some what nice steaks or <laughs> I don't know if that was you you and I were going in the ring um, what what is it that 
what, what are you, when you say people train in their body, what are they eating? What do they have to do before they go into well, a fight? I, the, the, the last year, the last four, uh, 48 hours, I believe the guys should have a lot of the particular there in the prop. One thing that's really strange, when I started training boxers, I used to have all these special diets and all these things, that's the nutritionist type situation. And I found out that everyone body is different, and you have to deal with what they're used to eating. And I, I have not uh, changed my boxer's diet like I used to in the past. Evander Holyfield was a good example. The uh, one fight that I trained him for, which was the second fight with Riddick Bolt, when he beat Bolt to regain the title, I noticed that Evander likes nothing but soul food, country food. Mm -hmm. And what would happen when he would, like the final week before a fight, he would come to the hotel, where, you know, and he would basically not eat anything because he didn't like steaks and lobsters and salads and whatever. And his weight would drop down to about 208, 210. And so when I had trained him for the two fights I worked with him with, which was for the uh, Alex Stewart rematch and then the uh, uh, match with both, I bought a lot of cooking stuff. And then when we came to Caesar's Palace, I actually had a big street up there because I cooked the food that he was used to eating, which he liked roast beef and chicken and mashed potatoes. And, and he came in about 216, the biggest I think he'd ever came in. Everybody's different. And, and, he was, and he was very, very strong because that's what his body was used to. Mm -hmm. So I really don't change that much. But if I have a normal guy, uh, that isn't really set in any one particular uh, way of eating. I like him to have the last fish, a lot of basically pasta, fruit, tremendous war amount of water. Water is just so healthy for the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, just basically fish and chicken and light foods such as that. Uh, one of the best diets I ever saw of a fighter, Julio Cesar Chavez. Yeah, well, great, great diet, great diet. Well, let me ask you, you, you all these fighters, um, you've trained all these people, is there anybody that you wouldn't train, any uh, boxers that you wouldn't train for any reason? Well, it's only one box I make. I really didn't like the way he carried himself as a person and things that he did. I didn't think he had enough morals, and that was uh, Trevor Burbick. So uh, even though I helped prepare him before he won the heavyweight championship, I decided to start a relationship. Mike Tyson, a lot of people ask why you never trained Mike. I, I, I would probably work very well with Mike. Mike is a very uh, charismatic person with a dual personality. But uh, the problem with Mike, Mike brought so much luggage with him. I would have to have Mike Tyson by himself. Mike is the type of a person that's always been really more comfortable with another strong personality around him, whether originally with Custer Amato, uh, Jim Jacobs, uh, Robin Gibbons and her mother, uh, Don King. But he's the type of person that seems to have to have that strong person to lean on. And the last few years, he's got just a whole slew of people around him. And he's not uh, seemed to be able to be organized himself. And not having an organized staff around him has made it even worse. But uh, the Mike Tyson would have to come almost alone, and I don't think that would ever happen. Mm. You know, it's, you, you talked so much about uh, the discipline, and we talked about risk and taking risk. And uh, the one little comment, one more comment about adversity. When somebody's hit with adversity and they're getting beat up and they're getting knocked down, what are the things that the boxers do to come right back? One, well, one quick tip. Perfect example, and one of my heroes, George Foreman. Mm -hmm. George Foreman is such a fantastic example to use. I mean, when you look at the A's, the this, the that, never no super skillful fighter, no flashy fighter. Fight with Michael Moore, his greatest accomplishment in his life will always be that, and that followed adversity leading into that. He's losing every round of the fight. Still, totally determined, still to land that one big punch, never gave up, and finally landed in, oh my God. Came back. History was made. Right back. Yeah. And we're going to come right back after this. Don't go away with Emmanuel Stewart. go and look at a stone cutter, hammering away at his rock perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two, and I know it was not that last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. And it's just like everybody else, we never see what's in the highlights. We always see the highlights, though, and we never see what's gone before, and, and based upon your experience and you being in the ring and all the people that you've trained, you know it's the effort, and I want to thank you for coming on also. Uh, Mark Roberts, um, <laughs> you know, he was on the show before, and, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have met you for dinner. And uh, you met Mark. Um, oh, how Mark. Did you, how did yeah, I meet Mark. He's an amazing guy. He's, I call him Boy Wonder. <laughs> I, 1970, about 1979, 80, I get a call from some friends that was the common friends, the Davenport family, who was close friends to him. Mm -hmm. They tell him they had a, 
and we, one of their buddies was trying to promote a boxer show, and you know, would I put a boxer on this car? And I told him yes. So I had a little white kid, uh, Brett Summers, and so he told me that this, you know, naturally knowing that Mark had to be white if there was history into it. And I come to a show, and here the other, and, uh, not only was it in a all black neighborhood, the fight was actually in the, the high school. And I come here with my little white fighter, and they call him the blue-eyed devil or whatever, right. all of this. And then I looked at Mark Roberts, I said, this, I can't believe this thing, you know. And anyway, after that, we got to be friends. And, well, you were his mentor. Yeah, and, 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 I, and, I, I, and we won the fight, and uh, in fact, uh, after that, the fighter came back again. He became very popular there. And Mark has just always been amazing to me. He's just, you know, he never ceases to... Uh, is the tenacity mm -hmm. you talked about, never giving up? No, he's, he's very special, though. Very special, very creative. And one of the kids that I really watch continually, because when he calls me up, I said, what new major thing have you did now? That's a, it's just, there's always something big. Mm -hmm. But he's very special, and, uh, and I'm going to Well, you're special him. for being here. I really appreciate it. Really do. It's My an pleasure. honor, and uh, you, you took the time to come out here. I really appreciate it. You're definitely class act, and like everybody talks about, they all say that. This is in Georgia. This mm -hmm. is a good place to come. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and may your future be as bright as a dime. Diamonds in the Rough has been brought to you by Custom Cleaner Home Dry Cleaning Kit and Valve Pack.